So, hey, everybody, and welcome to uh, the new show that I would like to call Half-Breed Magics. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Modern Masters 2015. Specifically, what I would like to do is to do a set review on this set for the draft format. So, because Modern Masters 2015 is going to be a format that you can draft at your local stores, and you should. You should draft it, because it's amazing. Alright, let me explain to you guys. It is so much fun. I know it's expensive to draft, but you should draft it any way you can. Cockatrice, MTGO, go to your local game store, draft it. You will have a blast. It is an incredible amount of fun. So the one thing I want to say, though, that's very important in draft is that Modern Masters 2015 as a whole is extremely synergy-based, right? So the more synergy your deck has, more often the more powerful it is. Now, the bombs are extremely bomby, but most of them, except for a few, one of which we'll talk about, are really only as bomby if you build your deck around them. And when it comes up, I'll show it to you. So what we're going to talk about today is the colorless cards and the white cards. And then the next video, we'll do the blue cards and then black and green. We'll go through the whole pie. And also the multicolors and the artifacts. All right. so first up is All is Dust. Now, All is Dust is one of those bombs where doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what deck you are. You could be playing any color and you could play All is Dust and when you cast it, it'll be insane. When you cast it, it'll be insane always, every time, in every deck. If you see this in a pack, you slam it. Unless you were going literally mono red aggro with just the readiest red deck, your most expensive card is three mana, you slam this card every time in draft, you cast it always, it will be amazing. Because just having it in your hand and having it in your deck is so much power because it allows you to control the flow of the game to the point where all this dust is backbreaking. Like, oh, I'll take a little bit more here so that he'll play one more guy, and then when I all is dust, I'll kill four guys, and I'll get a four for one, and I'll still have this big bomb in my hand, and then I'll win the game. Pfft. All is dust is nuts. If you have it, you're probably going to win the draft and feel real happy. So, next up is Artisan of Kozilek. Now, Artisan of Kozilek is an extremely good uncommon because of the fact that it fits in almost any deck. And in draft, it draft is a little faster, so you might not always reliably get to it. But if you're anywhere close to green, you can pick Artisan of Kozilek every time and it'll be really good. Not as good as All is Dust, but you'll have a huge creature, and if you have any target whatsoever, then Artisan is amazing. All you have to do is get to 9 mana, and 9 mana is more than 7, right? It's not as easy to cast as All is Dust, and that's why this is an uncommon and All is Dust is rare, obviously. But it's still really good, and if you ever get to attack with this thing, much less whatever you got back, oof, that's... They're not winning that game. They have to kill this on the spot. So next up is Emrakul. Emrakul, you take it in draft because it's worth a million dollars and it's always going to go up because it is the, the biggest creature in Magic, period. Probably will be forever. And it's worth a lot. So pick it. Don't play it. Please, in draft, don't play it. You'll die. I don't care how much ramp you have. 15 lands in a draft deck where you usually play 17 to 8 lands, getting to 15 mana or 15 lands is more than 90% of all of the lands in your deck. And that's just too hard to get to. Too hard to get to. Money, don't play it in your draft decks. Car, now, Car and Liberated. Car and Liberated is all is dust at Mythic. It's the same situation. No matter what, you take it and you play it because if you cast it, I don't think you can lose. I'm pretty sure it's it's just impossible. If you cast it, 
in draft, you will always win. Like, oh, put down this thing that has 10 life and gets a card. It's 10 whole life that they have to go through, not including anything you might have on the board. Or you just get to get rid of their best thing without any issue. Just kill it. Any permanent, gone. For good. No getting it back, no nothing. And if they don't have a creature on board to deal with it, then you can just keep doing things. It's insane. If you have it, you probably can't lose. Slam it every time, it's also a million dollars. Kozilek, uh, all the Eldrazi are worth a million dollars. Take them because they're worth a million dollars. Probably don't play them in your draft decks. Like, you have to have a lot of ramp guys to play this in your draft deck. Like, a lot of ramp guys. At, I would say that you would have to have at least six to eight guys that make mana for this to make it playable in your actual deck. And if you can get there, it's nutty how good it is. But getting there is going to be hard. And Ulamog is the same thing. It's a little diff more difficult to cast, so probably going to play it a little less often than Kozilek, but you take it because it's a million dollars, and if you're really, like, in deep green and you can get to it, play it, because if you ever get to cast it, you win that game all the time. And Ulamog's another... Like, all the Eldrazi are the same. If you can ramp to them, they're good. Right? The big difference between 7 and 8 mana... It might not seem like it, but there's a huge difference between 7 and 8 mana. Why Karn and all his dust are so good, and why the other Eldrazi are, need more help, right? You need more help to really get them to work. Because 8 mana is a lot more than 7, and 8 lands is a lot more than 7, and you'll feel it with this guy in your deck. But with any in any green deck, he's probably good because you'll have the ramp guys and you'll be able to make the manual and you'll be able to cast him and just right it says it attacks each turn if able for a reason. Because Annihilator is busted and if you have it, you swing. Right? You play this guy to put him in the red zone, it's obvious. If you're in green, take him. If you're not Probably just keep wheeling them and hope no one else takes them. But you'll probably be fine. Apostle's Blessing is next. It's good card. Good card. It can go... The more bombs you play, the better this card is. Really, like, the more value you get out of keeping one specific card on the board, the better it gets. In your white decks, you'll almost always play at least one. And in the other decks, you need a lot of bombs to justify it. You know, something that gets a trigger every upkeep or something with a continuous effect that you want to keep alive that is a real threat. Right? Uh, if you're in white, play one because it's always good. If you're not in white, eh, probably not. But if you have the threats, take it. It's sweet. Arrest, if you're anywhere near white, Pick it highly. Play it always. It strictly just takes one of their guys off the board pretty much forever. And removal is really good. Bread, bombs, removal, evasion, archetype. Right? Sounds good. Now, Battle Grace Angel in this format is basically Bane Slayer Angel. And if you don't know what that magic card is, look it up because... Baneslayer Angel is the definition of an angel in Magic. It is insane. It hits the board. It changes games. Five mana, five, five flying lifelink is insane. They can't race you. It is impossible for them to race you. They need to kill this, and even if they kill this, you have one combat step where you play it, and then you can swing right away to get the Exalted and the lifelink trigger. If you play this when you're tapped out, they're, you're going to have so much value. You're going to have a field day. They're going to die. They're going to cry into their hands, and you're going to win that game. 
<laughs> That's how it works. Battle Grace Angel. If this is pack one, pick one, you see this rare, you slam it, and you're like, I'm in white. Woo! Win in this draft. Celestial Purge. Pick it late as a sideboard card. Let it wheel all the way around the table. Get your good cards first, your guaranteed removal, your synergistic cards, and get the Celestial Pur Purge last. Where it's good, it's really, really good, but everywhere else, you just don't want it. You don't want it. Conclave Phalanx. Now, Convoke is the green-white sort of mechanic, right? It's the Convoke deck is for the green-white decks. And this is really your worst Convoke spell, right? By a long measure. Gaining life is nowhere near as powerful as losing life, right? Because your life is a resource. If you have a little bit more, you could still die, right? And it's a 2-4, so it doesn't block very well. It doesn't stop their bombs. And if you ever have to cast this guy for 5 mana, you're going to feel real bad. You're going to feel real bad. So... Don't play it unless you really need creatures. Court Homunculus. If you're the Artifact deck, the Artifact deck is the blue-white deck here. If you're the Artifact deck, Court Homunculus is awesome. One mana tutus are great. Two mana tutus are great in draft. You always want to play them because just having a body on two that your opponent has to deal with to get in some early damage gives you a huge tempo advantage and tempo is very important in draft, right? So if bears are good and you can get a bear for one mana, that's even better, right? If you have, you probably need at least eight, nine, or ten more artifacts, then this guy gets really, really good. But if you have that, it feels great. You know, if you see more than one, you can guarantee that you're the artifact deck and no one's drafting it. And then it'll be a great time. Because this guy in multiples can be pretty crazy. Having two 2-2s two on turn 2 is pretty gross. And that'll win you some draft games. Now Daybreak Coronet is a bunch of money and they need it. Because Boggles is stupid. And a lot of people want to build it. Because fucking Slippery Boggle. But I don't care how many are enchantments you have. Don't. Play it in draft. There's no number, I repeat, no number that is a high enough number to make it worth playing Daybreak Coronet in your deck. Now you're going to take it and you're going to be like, woo, $30 paid for my draft, pretty much almost, depending on where you are. And you're going to be like, yeah, now I can draft Modern Masters again because drafting is fun. And then you'll just put it in your binder and then you'll start drafting for real. <laughs> Now, Dispatch dispatch, and Court Homunculus obviously go in the same deck, right? Dispatch is the synergy card that's extremely powerful in the deck. If you are the deck, the Metalcraft deck, but if you're not, does literal nothing, right? This is the card for the Artifact deck that, like, you see it, and you're like... I might go the artifact deck. And then you look through the rest of the pack and you take an artifact and then you let the pack wheel. And if it's still there, then you are then you take it and you're really happy and then you're like, all right, I'm the artifact deck. But you don't take it the first time, right? You want to get artifacts first to make sure you have it and rather check if it wheels to make sure that you're really the artifact deck and you can take the dispatches. Uh, definitely, at least in pack one and pack two. You know, if you're in pack three and you have a lot of artifacts, then you can slam this because Path to Exile is insane. And Path to Exile with no downside is better. <laughs> Elish Norn. Elish Norn is unfair magic. It's in every white commander deck for a reason because if you can get to seven mana and play it, The game's over. The game's just over. If you have any creature, you deal them a huge amount of damage. If they have any creatures, you just cripple their entire board. Even maybe kill some stuff. 
and then still have this 4-7 with Vigilance in play. If you see Elish Norn, you take it every time. If you see Elish Norn, you take it every time. Even just to make sure someone else doesn't have it. Even You might even take it and then just be like, All right, I'm going to take this and I'm going to find every bauble or mana fixing I see. And if you're freaking blue-black, just be like, oh, I'll splash white, play Elish Norn. Or you're green-red, I'll splash white, play Elish Norn. Because if you get to cast this spell, you win that game. Pretty much guaranteed. It's it's the same thing. Uh, this is the nuttiest white rare you could possibly open. Plus, it's worth a lot of value to all the EDH players afterwards. Take it. Play it every time. Ugh. Man. It's powerful wizardry. Now, Fortify is really, really great in the token decks, right? And essentially, there's one pro who put it best. Fortify essentially has four modes. Because if you think about it, Trumpet Blast can only be done for attacking creatures, right? It only gives attacking creatures plus two plus so. So, Fortify technically has four modes. Right? It has attacking creatures get plus 2 plus 2, oh, attacking creatures get plus 0 oh, plus 2, but also blocking creatures get plus 2 plus 0, oh, or blocking creatures get plus 0 oh, plus 2. And options are always good. And the more creatures you have in your deck, the better this becomes, because the, then you'll have even more options, and it makes combat miserable for your opponent. Because if they know you have it, then... They can know you have it, and they still can't play around it, right? Because if they just be like, oh, I can't swing, because if I swing and he fortifies, he can choose to either wipe my whole team or just essentially fog, right? And then I'm tapped out, and then he cracks back and kills me, right? But if I don't attack and just sit here, he can swing and then cast fortify to either wipe my whole team or... Or, you know, have this huge combat trick that might kill me and wipe my board and then still cast other spells, right? The more creatures you have, the better it gets. And it's just there's so many options that it's super powerful. Now, Hikari Twilight Guardian is an uncommon and probably one of the best white uncommons that's not a removal spell. Flying, or specifically evasion, is extremely good in draft. And 4-4s four are very big. Right? Sarah Angel is pretty much a bomb or a mythic and a mythic uncommon in every M set it's ever been printed to because it's just so good. And this is almost Sarah Angel. This is almost Sarah Angel. You know, if you have the Spirit or Arcane spells, it gets upgraded from a regular 5 mana 4 4 flyer, which is good. Right? In any white deck, it's a 5 mana 4 4 flyer, which is super good. And in the Spirit or Arcane deck, which is the black-white deck, it's Sarah Angel. Maybe even better, which is just amazing, right? But this is still a safe pick every time if you even are thinking about going white. You just take it because it's safe, and then you can figure out, uh, which version of white am I going? Because in any version of white, it's good, and it can kill them. It can kill your opponent dead, and those kinds of cards are the good ones. And... Now, Indomitable Archangel is just basically an upgrade of Hikari Twilight Guardian because, first of all, it's a 4 mana for a 4-4 four, four flyer, which kills them even faster, right? So, if you think about it, just to explain it a little, I know it's not going to make much sense, but Hikari is a 5 mana 4-4 four, four flyer, and this is a 4 mana 4-4 four, four flyer. So... In compare, to make Hikari, you'd have to staple a time walk onto this. Right? That's how powerful, that's how much of a difference it is. Now, you, you know, you just cast time walk by casting Indomitable Archangel instead of Hikari. Right? And if you're the artifact deck, it just becomes even better. But most of the time, it's irrelevant, right? Just the power of a 4 mana 4 4 flyer is so big that you take it and you can feel safe about playing some version of white, no matter which one. Now, Ionia is a reprint that has to happen because Ionia is the biggest angel ever printed, except Avicen, but 
she's the one with the biggest effect and everyone loves Iona and blah blah blah. She's a casual powerhouse and she's a constructed powerhouse and she's a commander powerhouse and everyone wants her. But man, three white is a lot, right? Three white is a lot with a format with not a lot of fixing. But still, like I said, the difference between seven and eight is pretty huge. And if you can get this early and be like, all right, I am the white deck, then beating a seven, seven flyer is really hard. You're going to win a lot of games if you get to cast this. And <laughs> I've said that about a lot of cards, but, you know, then again, we've spoken mostly about Aldrazi. And this is Modern Masters, a format with a lot of power, right? The power level of these cards is just so high, and that's why the draft format is so fun, right? <laughs> because imagine if, you know, you have two white decks playing against each other, and, you know, it's the white-black deck versus the white-blue deck or whatever. And one plays Elishnorn. Right? And then you're like, oh, man, this game's so over. Right? And then the opponent plays Iona. Naming white, right? That game just you know, totally turned on its head. You have to redo everything and think about it all again. And then you're like, oh, God. And those kind of games are Wake Modern Masters 2015 so fun. Because you have all these great interactions with all these busted cards. All right. Now, Kami of Ancient Law. If you're in white, bears are good. You should play them so you don't die to the aggressive decks, right? They, you, they just block something. And this one has a good upsize. Naturalize is, naturalize is good, right? Erase is good. Sometimes it'll be really good, and other times it'll just keep you alive in, from the aggressive decks, and sometimes it'll just get in a few damage. Now, if you're the spirit deck, it gets really great because then you can start soul shifting this guy and do all this really cool stuff of returning it to your hand to destroy even more enchantments or to just get a constant stream of chump blockers while you kill them with your Hikari or what your flying spirit, whatever, right? So it's a great guy, but you don't have to pick him early. You can wait, but when you see him and you take him, you're pretty happy that you're going to play it in white, you'll probably play at least one in every white deck, and it's good. It'll do work. Now, Core Duelist is one of those synergy based around cards, right? It's the same thing as Dispatch. Core Duelist is insane if you ever get to activate him, but activating him is hard, right? And you really need to have a good one. You really need to get at least plus two to make this card very powerful. You really want like all the other equipments that you want a plus two equipment to really get some value, right? Because then you get six damage and that's usually a three turn clock, right? Assuming that, you know, you do some other form of damage or they use Phyrexian mana spells, which do also exist in this format, right? So this is one of those cards where you see a core duelist and you're like, Maybe I want to go the enchantment, the, the equipment deck. I really like the equipment deck. And you look, is there an equipment? All right, I'll take that equipment, and then I'll wait for this core duelist to wheel around. And if he does wheel around, sweet, on the equipment deck, I'll take it, and I'll be the equipment deck, and then really try and draft the rest around core duelist to make him insane. Because playing essentially a 6-6 six, six on 3 is what you can do with this guy if you have the right deck, right? Now... Leyline of Sanctity is a reprint in Modern. Get it. Put it in your trade binder because it halfway pays for your draft and you'll trade it away. But don't play it in draft because it does nothing. In draft, it does nothing. Don't play it. Just trade it or sell it. Mighty Leap. Mighty Leap is really good in the sort of red-white pump decks or the red-white equipment decks. There are a lot of places where the plus two plus two will matter, like on your double striker, like if you ever get an equipment on your core duelist and you get the mighty leap, then it's like, ah, oh, so much value, but it's the same thing. You might want one in a small creature deck just for the trick, but usually it's more sort of wait to get it late, and if you're the red-white deck, maybe play a second one or maybe think about playing one in the first place. It's 
It's just okay. It's just okay. It'll pretty much always wheel. Now, Marion Crusader is... It's just a good... He's a good magic card on three, right? On three or on four or on five or on any mana count, he's just a good magic card. And he'll probably kill at least one creature or get in some damage. But if you ever play against any black or any green deck, their life will be miserable. Because 50% of their cards won't able to be at, interact with this in any way. And if you're playing against the black green deck, all you have to do is put this card on the battlefield at some point in time. And they probably can't win. They probably just won't be able to do it. And that's why it's so crazy. You, you pick it always and play it always and it makes you the white deck because most of the time it's just fine and you're happy to play it main deck. But sometimes it's just absurd and the best card in your deck. Now, Mirror Entity is also a really, really powerful rare. And I always love Changelings. Changelings are so cool. I, and just the flavor of them is so cool that the fact that they're all creature types and they can, you know, be all the things and do all this stuff. And it also, of course, helps with your spirit decks, right? The fact that you can get this guy back with Soul Shift is crazy. Because they have to kill Mirror Entity. They have to kill Mirror Entity. Right? Because otherwise you just have a mana sink every turn to make your guys huge. Huge! If you hit your land drops, you can just be like, Oh, I'll make a 4-4 four, four and attack with my 3 mana 4-4. Four, four. That's extremely hard to deal with. If this was just a 3 mana 4-4, four, four, you would play it every time in any deck and you would splash for it and it would be great. But it can do even more than that. It can go even higher. You always pick it, always play it, splash for it. It's only one white. It's easy to splash for the more creatures you have, the crazier the ability gets. You'll have a fun time. Moonlit Strider. Moonlit Strider is really, again, it's one of the synergistic cards. The more synergy it has, the better it is. You know, and the Soul Shift 3, right? Like, if you have the crazy combo of Soul Shifting 3 back, your Mirror Entity, or some other spirit, then, then you're doing the really powerful things of modern masters, right? Because that's what you really that's where you really want to be at with this format. I feel like you really want to be at the synergy based decks, right? Because having two or three of these guys and one good spirit to get back with it consistently is extremely powerful. Right? And you even have the ability to just sack it whenever you want. Right? You can just sack it and get back a spirit. And sometimes you can sack it protect one of your guys, and get back a spirit. And that's where it has the most value, right? And you want to create the situations where cards bring out the most value. If you're in the spirit deck, it's extremely good. If you're not in the spirit deck, you probably don't want to play it. Now, Mirror Smith is made for the blue-white artifact decks. Again, it's a, more of a synergy card. If you have artifacts, this card is crazy because you make a constant stream of chump blockers, you enable your metacraft, metalcraft faster, and it'll be a fun time. But don't really first pick it because you need the artifacts before the mirror smith to make it really good. Now, Oblivion Ring is a card where you don't need any synergy. Just like Arrest, it's just a strict upgrade of Arrest, right? Common to Uncommon kills a thing more dead. Ah, logic, language. No, obviously, but Oblivion Ring, you don't need any synergy. You play it in your white decks. You play it in your non-white decks because it's removal, splashing for it's easy. It's only one white. Gets rid of one thing forever. You play it every time. It's super great. Don't need any synergy. Just take it. Just take it. Just take it and be happy. Otherworldly Journey. Otherworldly Journey is a neat combat trick in the little creature decks. It's a neat protection spell in your little aggressive creature decks. You know, in your blue-white deck, it'll protect your Mirror Smith. 
in your red white deck it'll protect your you know aggressive double striker from a removal spell but uh in the spirit deck it'll do even more right if you have the arcane spells it'll trigger all the things and you'll get all these triggers and that's where it'll be the most powerful again right it's fine on its own and if you get one copy late in a pack you'll take it and you'll probably play it and it'll be and it'll be good you know it'll save your creature from a removal spell and it's good because synergy is good but it is in on its own a synergy piece so where in the specific deck it's even better than it is normally now raise the alarm is a card that again is the same as otherworldly journey it's great in almost every deck just as essentially a two mana tutu but in the places where it's good it's even better than that right so you're never sad about playing this in any deck where you're playing white but you're super happy about playing this deck in the green white tokens deck right this is the thing where you see one of those bomb uncommons and you're like all right i want to be the token deck and you shuffle over and you see a raise the alarm and you're like oh sweet i'll take this raise the alarm and then i'll take that bomb uncommon you know that that build around uncommon later right sky hunter skirmisher that's your aggressive double striker deck right this is where you want more mighty leaps just as a pump spell right if you have one of these guys in play mighty leap becomes titanic growth which is in green and having a green spell in white is powerful the color pie exists for a reason right and the fact that this guy flies is great three mana two two flyers are still good and limited and if you're in the red white deck it'll be even better now spectral procession is again it's just really really great in any deck that's playing white because if you're paying four for this you're still totally happy if you're paying four for this you're still totally happy if you're paying five for it you're probably a little less happy and that's probably not something you really want to be doing but if you ever pay three for it it's just nuts in the synergy based token decks it's insane right this is that kind that kind of card you want again you know if you see you know another bomb uncommon you're like oh you look for the spectral zero possession first and then you get the other piece that works around your tokens later right Sunlance, piece of great removal in white. You want it most of the time. It's just a really great piece of removal. Having one will save you from a lot of the aggressive decks, and drafting a second for your sideboard is always worthwhile. Right? Sunspear Shikari, this is the red white artifact aggressive deck again, right? And this is the one that sort of has more value, right? Now, Core List is really great. But you have to work a little harder for Core Duelist than you do Sunspear Shikari. Because in Limited, First Strike and Lifelink is better than Double Strike. Most of the time. Because the ability to race is a huge tempo gain, and Draft is a tempo format. Right? So, and Sunspear Shikari is okay too as a bear. If you're just like, oh, I didn't see any Kami of Ancient Laws, and I'm just going to die to the aggressive decks. Then you just take a Sunspear Shikari and you're like, oh, cool, I have a two mana 2-2 two -two, and it'll trade with the aggressive guys and I'll live longer. Sweet. Now, Tajnar Swordsmith is, again, like Core Duelist. You want it in the aggressive decks, but don't pick it early. Make sure you have at least two or three or four artifacts to potentially find with this guy because if you don't, four mana 2-3s are real bad and not what you want to be doing, but if you can find an art equipment, then it's great because you can just put it right in play and potentially also equip it or do other things, but probably not because you paid this X on this four, already four mana creature, right? But still, it helps you enable your deck. You see this guy in the pack, you'd be like, oh, cool, I love the artifact deck. Let me see if there are any artifact equipments. You take it, and then you hope this guy wheels, and boom, equipment deck, equipment aggressive deck. Now, Tarashi's Grasp, you... In your white decks, you're never sad to have one for your sideboards for someone who has some bomb, enchantment, or artifact. But in the Sorcery Arcane deck, you might even be able to play one main board to trigger all your, you know, 
all your wax main bakus right here, which we'll get to. Right, and because once you get those triggers, then it's even better. And sometimes you might just be able to cast it to destroy one of your own things and gain some life, and you know trigger all your wax main bakus and thief of hope, and which is a card we'll get to later in black, and. It'll be great, and you might win that game because you destroyed your Iron Artifact, and, you know, those are the really complex plays that make magic great. Right? Now, Wax Main Baku is the defining part, or the second defining part. It's the defining white part of the Spirit Arcane deck. You probably want every copy you can get your hands on, because if you get to trigger this guy multiple times... It is insane. You can essentially, on some turns, pay one mana, if you have enough key counters on them, to wipe their whole board. Right? And you can do it at instant speed. So, right, dur you can, during their combat, tap down their whole board, then you have a whole turn to swing in and maybe cast some more Spirit Arc and Arcane spells and then just tap their whole board all over again. Right, again, this is like, or you see some great spirit and arcane spells, and you take this guy, and then you're just like, oh man, I'm the spirit deck, and I'm really happy. Because this guy, this guy will win you a lot of games very fast, and even though it looks really weird and really creepy, Kamigawa was my set and my shit, and I loved it. And now that guy's is all the white cards in Modern Masters 2015. Uh, I hope this little ramble of mine was in some way helpful for the to prepare you for the draft format of Modern Masters 2015. So if you like this at all, you know, tell your friends and uh, I hope to see you at all the Modern Masters 2015 events. Uh, I will be going to every single one I humanly can because this format is awesome, guys. It is amazing. You will have a blast no matter what deck you're playing. The color combinations are great. The synergies are extremely powerful. And the interactions you can have are some of the best magic to be played out there. So I'll see you guys next time. And uh, have a good time playing magic, man. Half-read magics, powerful wizardry out there. Bye.